For over 50 years, the commercial helicopter industry has proven itself to be a very effective means for serving individuals, companies, and communities. The services provided by these helicopters are as far-reaching and diversified as the helicopter is versatile. However, an unacceptable number of these helicopters, their pilots, and passengers have succumbed to senseless and often tragic crashes. And the highest percentage of these crashes have been caused by human error, namely pilots making poor safety of flight decisions. What's even more alarming is that the same mistakes are being made over and over again throughout our industry. As you go through this training and watch the scenarios, we suggest that you should concentrate heavily on the error chain depicted in each scenario and how these steps ultimately lead to a crash. Ask yourself, what were the contributing factors? Were there opportunities to break the chain? Was there a specific culture within the company that influenced the pilot's decision making? And were there direct and or indirect pressures affecting the decisions of the pilot? Finally, before we begin with the scenarios, it is important to emphasize that this video would not have been possible if it were not for the support of the helicopter operators shown in the scenarios and named in the closing credits. These companies allowed the use of their equipment and personnel and the display of their logos for the demonstration of unsafe practices in the sincere hope that taking a proactive approach through this training will help to significantly improve the safety record of our industry. Business was good for this two-year-old helicopter company. They had made a positive name for themselves, providing sightseeing, photography, and charter service in this large city market. Additionally, they recently signed their first major electronic news gathering contract for one of the major networks. The bidding competition was fierce, the budget was tight, and the contract was short-term, with a long-term renewal option based on satisfactory performance. Paul has been a pilot for this operation since its founding and one of the three full-time pilots employed here. He has a good safety and work history and enjoys his job. But it hasn't been all easy. The news contract has added a much higher workload to the pilots because of the 24-hour service required. Also, the customers often showed a lack of understanding about safety of flight issues, especially regarding weather. One of the three pilots had been out sick with the flu, leaving Paul and the other pilots to carry the load with no brakes. The network doesn't care about the operator problems, they just want their aerial video. The 24-hour, seven-day-a-week demands of a news contract also added a new workload for the maintenance department, as the entire company tried to deal with making it through the trial contract period, and ultimately winning that long-term contract. This day started like most others. Maintenance was checking the helicopter, and finally dealing with some small squawks because the helicopter flew most of the night on a big story about a large protest demonstration that went out of control. Paul checked the forecast for his day shift to determine how the weather might affect his entire day. Often when the call comes in for a hot story, there's no time to receive an update, especially when you know your competition will be racing you to be first on the scene. Maintenance released the helicopter, but reminded Paul that a replacement fuel quantity sending unit for the one that was acting up the previous night had been ordered, and to watch his fuel consumption carefully. Paul pre-flighted his aircraft and began his flying day with the morning traffic watch flight and covering two associated auto accidents. Paul and his camera operator noticed the fuel gauge problem, but they would handle it with more frequent fuel stops. Shortly after the traffic watch duty and a quick refueling, Paul and his crew were back out covering a train derailment and a van fire. When Paul finally had a break in the action, he was immediately recruited to give a safety and security briefing to some local fire department trainees. It wasn't long before Paul and the crew were back out to cover a structure fire and then happened to be on scene for a car chase that ensued. Soon the chase concluded and as the helicopter was returning to base, they were dispatched to a rescue operation where three fishermen were trapped on a jetty due to the rising tide. Paul wanted a quick fuel stop because he wasn't sure about his exact fuel consumed, but the competition was already on the way, and the network on Paul's contract wanted to break into live coverage and told him to get there immediately and preferably first. Paul did arrive first, just in time to transmit video of the first fisherman being lifted into the rescue helicopter. The competitor arrived a couple of minutes later, and they both covered the rescue of the second fisherman. By this time, Paul was really uncertain of how much fuel he had left due to the bad gauge and told his producer that he wanted to return. She became emphatic about him staying on the scene as long as the competition was there and the third victim was rescued. Since the rescue was progressing quickly, Paul decided to stay on scene until the third victim was removed from the jetty.
This prominent helicopter flight training company has been very busy lately. The need for qualified pilots has been at an all-time high, and the time has never been better for career pilot hopefuls. School enrollment has been nearly to capacity, and the students and instructors have never been more enthused about their prospects for finding work as a career helicopter pilot. One of the company flight instructors, Manny, who has about 1,250 hours total time, is now very pleased at how employable he is in the mainstream of the industry. Because of this, he was preoccupied with faxing off resumes, making phone calls, and performing other activities associated with moving on from the world of flight instruction. With over 1,000 hours of instruction behind him, he is extremely comfortable in the aircraft and has developed a feeling that he can recover from any situation a student might put him in. Manny also has been telling his students that pre-lesson and post-lesson briefings are really not necessary. And he'll just talk about their lesson plan in the air, in spite of the fact that the other company instructors are all conducting formal lesson briefings with their students. On this day, the student had already been waiting for 15 to 20 minutes for Manny to first get off the phone and then to finish telling his buddies about his conversation with a potential employer. A company supervisor reminds Manny that he and his student are now running well behind schedule, and if they are going to get the lesson done prior to the next time slot, they need to get going. Manny tells the student to shorten the pre-flight, since the aircraft had just been flown, and hurry and get the helicopter started. The student did as he was told, performed a quick cursory pre-flight, and then immediately began the starting process. After another quick phone call, Manny arrived at the helicopter and climbed in as the student was still working through the checklist. Manny, who was unhappy with the slow progress being made, takes the checklist from the student and puts it away, saying there's no time for that now. Manny skips the run-up checks and takes the controls himself for the departure. As he does so, he's still finishing his can of soda, which he holds between thumb and forefinger, while he holds the cyclic with his other three fingers. The pickup was abrupt and hurried from the parking area, and the actual airport departure consisted of a rapid 360-degree turn, followed by a very exaggerated nose-over takeoff. The aggressive takeoff caught the attention of other instructors and their students who were standing on the ramp. They were all commenting and shaking their heads in disapproval of this cowboy style of flying. Once in the practice area, Manny conducts a reasonably professional lesson for the first 20 to 30 minutes, concentrating on hover work. But then he starts to get a little bored and decides to add a little entertainment to the program. After cautioning the student never to do this himself, he takes the controls. His routine begins with a rapid pedal turn, similar to what he did at the airport, followed by another Hollywood-style departure. He then pitches down into a long utility path cut between tall trees and does a high-speed run, nearly touching the ground as he followed the path. Manny was obviously enjoying this maneuver and looking for his students' approval. Once they approached the end of the path, Manny did an abrupt pull-up, followed by a hammerhead-style turn to take another pass down the path. Manny then flew the aircraft back to the flight school base where he quickly brought the helicopter into the parking area and abruptly planted it on the parking pad. He left the student to do the shutdown, exited the helicopter and proceeded to the office so he could continue with his job hunting calls. The student really enjoyed this experience and believed it was the best flight he'd had so far. He tells this to a couple of his fellow student buddies and describes the details of the flight with great animation. Excited about his new helicopter experience, the student decided he wanted to fly some more and took an aircraft out for a solo flight. It had been a long hitch for this longtime company pilot, Grady, who was also a training captain and Czech airman. This was the last day of 21 straight days that included his regular 14-day hitch, plus an extra seven days after his scheduled hitch. The company was short of qualified crews, needed the help, and Grady appreciated the extra money. His relief pilot agreed to come in earlier than normal so that Grady could make it to the airport in time to catch the last jump seat out for the day. But this day would be no different from the others, and Grady was very busy with differing assignments, including typical flights to rigs and various aircraft, training work that needed to be completed, and performing maintenance run-ups. Lunch consisted of nothing more than vending machine snacks, but he was looking forward to going home to participate in a family trip. 
Later that day, the dispatcher informs Grady of an urgent flight that was needed to take critical parts to a rig that had broken down, and he was the only captain available. The importance of this flight to the oil company is stressed, and they're anxious to get it working again. Grady called in a newly hired co-pilot, and they discussed the flight, which was a considerable distance from the base. The dispatcher did indicate that they had plenty of fuel on the destination rig. Grady figured that even with the distance to travel, if he departed within 10 minutes, he could still be back in time to catch his jump seat flight. Because of the past everyday routine with dispatchers and fuel availability, and the shortness of time, Grady decides not to take on fuel at the base and just refuel at the rig while the parts are being unloaded. Although the co-pilot notices the lack of planning, he does not challenge the captain, nor did he bring the fuel sheet, missing Grady's request to bring it during all the rush. Anxious to get flying, Grady also goes against company policy and loads the heavy cargo with his co-pilot because he didn't want to wait for company ground personnel. Grady cuts short his walk around and hurries the co-pilot. They depart for the rig. The trip progresses normally. The weather is good, the winds are calm, and they arrive at the rig at Grady's projected time. After a quick circle around the rig, Grady sets up his approach and lands. After removing the parts, Grady begins the fueling process only to be stopped by a rig crew member who advises that the fuel pump has broken down. Grady asked his co-pilot for the fuel sheet only to find out it was left at the base. Grady then rechecked his remaining fuel and distance from the home base and believed they had the ability to make it back with existing fuel on board. He also figured he could still make the jump seat if there were no other delays and they departed for the base immediately. En route, Grady and the co-pilot kept a close watch on their time, speed, distance and fuel burn. Although the margins were far less than customary, Grady still believed they could make the base with a small reserve. The co-pilot decided to plot a course for a rig that he knew had fuel and was much less flying time than direct to the base. But it would take them off course and delay their arrival to the base and Grady would certainly miss his jump seat flight. Still, they pressed on with the lightly loaded helicopter making good speed. With 60 miles to go and 345 pounds of fuel left, Grady nervously continued to convince himself that they still had enough fuel to reach the main base. It's midsummer in Alaska and the high season for tourist activity. The cruise ships were in port for the day and tour flights were fully booked at this helicopter tour operation, which has begun its second season in business. Their business is a popular one because not only do they offer flight seeing over spectacular mountains, glaciers and ice falls, they also combine the flight seeing with dropping their passengers on the glacier for trekking and camping. Although the tourists enjoy anything the helicopter company provides, the pilots especially enjoy the opportunities to get deep into the higher country, which is often restricted when the weather is low. During the past several days, the weather has been too bad to fly, and it was decided to take advantage of the downtime and do some scheduled maintenance early. However, on the following day, the weather unexpectedly began to improve, and the maintenance crews were immediately under pressure to get the work completed in a much shorter time period than originally anticipated so as not to miss any flights. An hour before the first group is scheduled to be picked up at the dock, the Air Tour Company dock representative arrived to meet the shore excursion manager from the ship to coordinate the day's departures. Due to the marginal weather and the reports of cancellations for the last several days, the shore excursion manager makes it clear if there's any likelihood the group will not be able to fly, she would rather reschedule them on another activity. The shore excursion manager also mentions that the other helicopter company that offers flight seeing trips for the ship's passengers is flying. After more assurances from the air tour company representative, the group leaves the dock for the heliport. The group arrived at the heliport where they are outfitted and briefed for their glacier flight and trek. Dispatch is concerned that the next group is scheduled to leave town shortly and they need to let the dock rep know if she should send them out or not. The shore excursion manager from the ship wants to know if the first group is going to fly on time and threatens to cancel the rest of the departures and book her passengers on other trips if the tour flights aren't going to proceed as scheduled. The pilot, Jason, reminds the mechanic of the tight situation and the final stages of the work is completed in a rush and the aircraft is put back online in time for the tour flights. The shore excursion manager is informed to continue sending the groups and the flights would proceed. 
The first group boards the helicopter. Jason does a cursory walk around and then departs for the first of many scheduled tours. The flight began well, but the weather began to worsen with lowering ceilings and ring prison. As the flight continued, the weather didn't change. However, an occasional small vibration in the pedals did get Jason's attention. But the passengers were engrossed in the ride, so he decided to continue the flight and have maintenance check it out upon return. Additionally, Jason, having been bored with not flying for days, decided to go to a special site in the higher country that he knew would really thrill his passengers, and it would be fun for him. As he got closer to the site, he encountered weather that caused more concern about terrain obscuration and whiteout possibilities. But he had promised his passengers to take him to this site and didn't want to back out on his announcement. His tail rotor pedals had settled down, and since he knew this area well and the landing zone was just over the next ridge, Jason decided that he could probably deliver on his claim to get to this special landing spot. <laughs> 